Who's to blame for the global chaos? ISIL terrorists have beheaded at least 12 like-minded but rival militants in Syria, underlining the violent confusion of recent years. Yet America and the European Union have allowed their allies, including Saudi Arabia, Qatar and NATO member Turkey, to arm and fund these militant groups. That's one reason an increasing body of opinion holds the West responsible for the unrest there and in other regions around the world. The creation and growth of militant groups in Syria and Iraq coincided with the worsening aftermath of the Western invasion, which many people can't even recall the causes for in the first place. The destruction of Iraq and Syria following these aggressive Western military policies has led many to distrust the administrations in the US and also in the European Union, particularly about war. Worse still, the policy of sanctions against Syria and the training and funding of armed groups that openly cooperate with Al-Qaeda has caused many to question the refusal of Western governments to canvass their citizens about the wars they launch. So why did the US and the UK invade Iraq? Why did these invading governments fail to consult their own citizens about their war plans? And which side has killed more civilians, ISIL or the West? These are the simple, if troubling, questions we sought to answer. And we began by investigating what links the British and the American public saw between their country's invasion and destruction of Iraq and the growth of ISIL. Here's what they said. That's a very difficult question because I think all the implications are very subtle um, and very interlinked, but instinctively I'd say yes. Uh, why would you say yes? Instinct. Can't justify it. It just feels um, that it is a very complicated and complex situation. Um, and the very fact that we were involved in it at all must have some bearing on it, so I would say yes. Uh, I don't know, it's pretty heavy, but I don't think any of it's good, you know. Um, to be honest, I wouldn't have a clue. I don't know a lot about this issue at the moment, unfortunately, but I wouldn't be able to tell you. Yeah, I think it wasn't thought out, the kind of exit strategy with a plan for the country, you know, beyond the war, you know. It, there wasn't a considered plan for how to rebuild the infrastructure in the country, and I think as a result of that, I don't see nothing. No link. I just don't see no link. There's no question about it. I mean, the West has essentially created the situation in the Middle East. There's no question about it. I mean, the situation was unfortunate before with the lack of democracy, but there is still a lack of democracy there, plus on top of it, the violence and the death and destruction. Um, there's no question. I mean, Tony Blair, uh, George Bush the Younger, uh, and us as voters in the West are undoubtedly partly responsible for what happened there. Complicated links possibly, but I'm not sure there's any direct correlation. Definitely, absolutely definitely. I just think the whole thing's just blown all out. I mean, it's just getting bigger and bigger. It's quite frightening. I see that as the government is trying to address the problem with ISIS, but they're not doing an adequate job with it. Um, I feel like they should put more effort towards that. As, as, and also domestic issues to strengthen the country and make the people feel good about what they're doing. In a very, very small way. I mean, we've just come to an impasse now where it was a time for development. There's such chaos in the Middle East and old Mesopotamia, which is now what we call Iraq. If politicians, French and British, had done what Lawrence of Arabia had wanted and split Mesopotamia into three, I doubt you'd have had much trouble with the Sunnis and the Shia, right, and other groups there, Christian as well. Uh, it's all connected, all terrorism, I think, is... Those were the views of the public. We asked our experts to assess the link between Britain and America's military actions in Iraq and the rise of ISIL. As uh, soon as uh, the Western allies declared mission accomplished, what you had at the same time is the Ba'athist uh, uh, ex-party members were essentially causing and, and making their own militia and that le eventually led with the 
uh, sort of fake Islamic rhetoric as well as the very strong anti-imperialist rhetoric that led them towards creating a big militia and, uh, and with the help of just leftover US arms in, uh, in Iraq that helped them go into ISIS that we see today. So there's a direct correlation between the US invasion, the aftermath and the, the sort of circus that they created for the Western public and, and, and the growth of ISIS itself. Why did your country invade Iraq? We put that direct question to the British and American public. Um, I'm thinking it has something to do with our um, allied friendship with America, obviously a special relationship we've had over the years. Um, but again, <laughs> I wouldn't know enough about it to make a judgment of any kind, unfortunately. Please inform me. Inform me. I don't know myself. Okay. And you think a lot of people don't know? I think a lot of people don't know. We say con like control, like political power control in, of that area of the globe, which seems really like strong, like strong economic and political strengths, both like in the oil and other like political aspects. Politics, oil, um, defence, a whole host of reasons that probably the British people know very little about. They wanted to take the oil, I think. That's what. That's my personal opinion, you know. Uh, um, I think probably as a response to 9-11 and the America needing to show that they're doing something. Uh, I don't know. I'm really like political, on a political stance, but, you know, I guess oil. Why did we invade it? Well, it's all about oil, I think. Um, yeah, that's about it, really. Bush, really Bush. Yeah. Well, we wanted to be great friends with the Americans and Blair's attitude. Uh, I mean, you, I've seen one picture of him. He wants to be so popular. When he was in power, he's, he's got his guitar at number 10. I mean, what is all that about? I'm a working man with no education. No, never had an education. I want people to rule my, me and this country that I look up to that are brighter than me, but half of them are not even as bright as I am with no education, yet they've gone through the whole system. I can't understand it. I'm not sure. Well, my personal theory is that um, it was a personal vendetta on the part of the Bush family. I think that there was, as we say in North America, it stuck in their crawl, it stuck in his crawl, particularly the older Bush, uh, President Bush 41 that he got booted out of power in 92 in favor of Clinton while Saddam Hussein was still comfortably sitting in his perch in, in Baghdad. Um, I just felt that the, the Bush family in particular and their cronies felt that there was unfinished business uh, regarding Iraq. Personally, I believe George Bush, he had in, um, his father, W, was looking, I mean his father, um, H, or George H, whatever, he was looking for um, Saddam, so I think that um, it was a father-son issue and his father, his son was trying to finish out what his father originally started out to do. What were the real reasons for the invasion of Iraq by Britain and the US? We asked our experts. Well, we were told that we had to invade Iraq because Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction which could be launched on Britain or perhaps British bases in Cyprus within 45 minutes. All of this was utter nonsense. There were no weapons of mass destruction as we know. We were told we had to invade Iraq because we had to cut out this cancer of Al-Qaeda. There was no linkage between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda. Indeed, they hated each other. And as I just said, the, since that in the invasion, Al-Qaeda and other similar groups have spread and grown around that. I think more importantly, the Americans wanted to invade Iraq, first of all, to control the oil. Oil that Europe and Japan and other countries relied upon, but America wanted to have the squeeze in that oil. Secondly, it was about the United States exerting its military dominance in the world at a time of its relative economic decline in the face of, Ch uh, of China. And the British went along as they do with all American adventures, or almost all American military adventures, to show they were the loyalists of the loyal allies, with, of course, disastrous results. Well, I mean, we, we as a country know that it was essentially invaded upon a lie. Uh, the politicians generally try and make out that it was something that they made of best intention at the time, but with the sort of evidence that was created, gained by torture methods and another single strand of evidence that 
you know, Saddam Hussein had ma weapons of mass destruction, we uh, begin to really understand as well as part of the corporation's profits from the invasion of, of Iraq. We begin to understand that the only conclusion that seems logical is mainly because of corporations' profits, especially the arms trade as well, where governments are consistently using uh, the arms trade and their links with of uh, dictators across the world to, to create profits for them as well. Do you trust your government when it comes to decisions about war? That's the question we put to the American and British public. No, not at all. Why is that? Because I think politics is a very questionable business and I would be very suspicious of anything um, that governments come out with of any persuasion. No, not at all. Why should I? They putting everybody else's life in jeopardy and they standing back and doing nothing. That's a hard one, I don't really know. I don't know, I don't, possibly not. <laughs> I trust them to an extent. I feel like there's a lot of hidden motives underneath why they do certain things. But for the most part, yes, because we have the best military in the world. So um, when you have an issue, I feel like they go after and address it. But sometimes I don't completely agree, but for the most part, I do. I would hope so. Like, they have a better understanding than I do. Like, I'm just a student, and they should have a stronger political stance on these aspects. Like, they, shouldn't, like, they should know. Like, I trust them. That's why I vote. I trust them to vote and to do the, my decisions for me, like, decisions I'm not capable to do and I trust them to do them for me, so. I do trust the American government, but anytime there's a big group of people making decisions or top decision makers, you should take a critical look at those decisions being made. I don't know, it's quite a tough question to ask. I mean, I'd like to think that we've been told what we want to hear. I mean, as in the positive aspects. I'm sure there's a lot going on behind the scenes, but as far as I'm aware, nothing that I know of. I wish I could curse, but no. I do not, not at all. No. No. As a result, a result of what happened over Iraq, I don't think I do. Uh, you would like to think that lessons have been learned from that, but I'm not sure that they have. I think that what's happening now uh, is a very complex and difficult situation. It's not one I know the answer to, but I don't think that bombing in, uh, a civilian population is going to be an answer to anything. No, not really. I have no other choice. I mean, I'm too old now because I won't be around to take the frat afterwards. And the other generations, I'd be a liar if I'm worrying about everybody coming behind me because this has been history throughout, or throughout history. The next generation inherit the mistakes of the past, uh, past generations. No. Why not? I don't know. It just um, it seems like there's like a higher agenda, you know, not really in our interest, more in theirs. We asked our experts if they felt these governments could be trusted on questions of going to war. I think back in 2003, the majority of the British population, in fact, I don't think, I know, that all opinion polls show that the majority of the British population were against the invasion of Iraq. They saw the biggest ever demonstration in British history in February 2003 against that, uh, that invasion. London, the city we're in, was united in its, almost in its opposition to that, as exemplified by the, the, the then Mayor Ken Livingston. As a consequence of that, we have seen that there had to be a vote in the House of Commons over possible military action in Syria, which the government lost. And we have seen that the, the government has now pledged that if there's any further military adventures, it will have to take a vote in the House of Commons at a minimum. That is proof that they recognise there is a serious credibility gap that people in Britain feel they were lied to about the Iraq invasion. And now at least there has to be at least a minimal, minimal democratic decision making in favour of any of these invasions. So people, yes, feel lied about and feel bitter about on the basis of those lies. We saw the destruction of Iraq and all that has happened as a consequence of that. I think generally the country overall is very um, distrustful of the government when it comes to war uh, issues and we've seen more distrust when it comes to issues of such. However, there has been far more complex ways to fearmonger. Uh, we see now with ISIS and, 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 and the way in which it, it sort of operates around the world, this way of trying to fearmonger and use the rhetoric to hype up the, the threats of, of ISIS to try and bring in like, uh, more initiatives to invade Syria, to, uh, to get uh, boots on the ground, as well as to rule civil liberties as well in the UK.
Which entity has killed more innocent civilians in the last 15 years, ISIL or the army of your government? We pose that question to the public in America and in the United Kingdom. I would probably think our side has done, but it may be the case that we don't actually know the extent of casualties. Maybe we're not being reported the correct figures, but yeah, I would say it's our side, definitely. What makes you have that feeling? I just think, this is my point of view obviously, that we're a bit more sort of advanced in terms of military equipment and stuff like this, so that's where I'm sort of uh, coming from, so that respect. Uh, I don't know, I have respect for the troops, so I don't, I don't know, I don't really forgot anything else. Our government's home, I would guess, yeah, for sure. Why do you feel that? Well, we just seem to go into everywhere, you know. Yeah, it's a bit, yeah. Government armies, um, 15 years, that's a long period of time. ISIL has been around for a while, but the last couple of years they've really been ramping up what they've been doing and their graphic, um, demoralizing, just killings and mass murders have not really tapped how much of our army um, has done, so. You always get the, like, the Western governments and their drones and it's a way of like, I guess, the power scheme, like the West and America has a lot of influence on who they attack and when they attack. So I guess they get a lot of innocent lives are lost. Always, war is not war is always like both sides lose. But I guess in this sense, they lost a little bit more. When in the last 15 years, ISIS. Probably British and American, but. I think that's a difficult one to answer, really. Probably our government. I think they kill a lot of civilians? Uh, possibly. I think without any question, I think that the, the West Baldwin campaign has killed you know, a completely disproportionate number of people in comparison to the terrorist response. How do you feel about that? I think it, I feel ashamed. I don't want that to be in my name. I don't want, I feel, you know, when I, if you travel the world and you speak to people of other countries, you don't want to be associated with that behaviour. I don't know. I would say, I mean, we don't, you, you work out, even if you take the, the Balkan situation with Yugoslavia, uh, we were bombing Serbia around the clock virtually at one time in the Americans. Then you take these other places in the Middle East, we have, must have killed more civilians than anybody else re in reality. I mean, I don't know, I've got no proof. I've, I don't believe in statistics because they always, always seem to bend them what way they want, you know. My government army. You think they kill a lot of civilians? Yes, they do. Let's get the facts from our experts on whether ISIL or the Anglo-American Alliance has killed more civilians since the year 2000. Uh, I think it's now the case that Western intervention around the world dwarf anything that ISIS are able to destroy. Of course, they're butchers, but they don't have the warplanes and the drones and the technology that we're seeing. And really, the Americans, although they've pulled out of uh, inv involvement on the ground, the drone warfare continues with devastating results in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, and other parts of, uh, parts of the globe. So in terms of the body counts, it's a gruesome way of looking at it. But the biggest pile of victims lies with the Americans and their allies, including in Britain. Well, I mean, it's been recently found that Western governments have essentially killed 4 million Muslims since 1990. Now, compared to the existence of ISIL, uh, ISIS and, and what they have done, it's nothing in comparison. And if we think about one people going around the world for two decades, killing millions of another type of people, and then to claim that they are morally superior, it's, it's absurd. And if you don't call that white supremacy, what else do you call that? Why have the British and American governments never asked the opinions of their public about the wars they've launched? The public said this. I don't really know, but they never do, I believe. That's it. I think it does ask the opinions, and we get to state our opinions every four years or every two years, depending on who we're electing. That's a good question. I wish I knew the answer to that. You think they should ask their opinion? Definitely. Because we might give it, and then they've got to act on it. Um, and I don't think they'd like that. What do you think the country might say to the government if they ask permission? No. 
The people are peaceable, governments are not. I don't think they care about the public's opinion, they do what they want regardless of what we think. I think it all roots down to the fact that we have elected the government in power, so we're sort of already given our voice to them and they come from the, they speak on our behalf. Maybe unfortunately sometimes that's not something that's um, we feel the right way about it, but obviously we made our choice when we voted, unfortunately. Point blank, they don't care about our opinion. They just want to do what they got to do, get the money and get what they can take out of other countries, the booty, and keep it moving. Because they want to hear the answers. <laughs> That's a long chart of it. They want to make their decisions and justify it afterwards. I have no clue. Do you think they should ask the opinion? I think so. They're a bit of a, a, bit of a hodgepodge, aren't they, all together? You have one man at the top, and if he's strong, the rest becomes strong. Go back to Fetcher. I mean, she had some very softies around her, but she pulled them together. In the end, it is personal, personality and leadership, and you're lucky if you've got good ideas. But unfortunately, we've got guys now that haven't got that. You know, people say, oh, it's the party line, it's our policies that matter. It's not. It's the man who projects, focuses on those policies and then presents them. And if it sounds good, it's acceptable to the general public. Because they're going to do it, whatever they want to do, you know? regardless of what anyone thinks. So. We gave our experts the final word on why these Western governments did not invite public comment on the decision to go to war. I think the simple answer is that it's always afraid that the people of Britain will say no more. Uh, up until 2003, the British government relied on the simple loyalty and patriotism of the British public. In 2003, that was dented beyond repair. And now, as I say, they can't just rely on automatically getting that response when they raise the flag. So they have to actually at least go through a vote in the House of Commons to get that uh, consensus. And there is a, a real leg uh, deficit in terms of trust left behind by the Iraq invasion, which no government, and we should remember that the Labour was in government when it launched that war. They are labelled with, uh, with lying about that war. Tony Blair is now running scared of being dragged before an international court, but the current Conservative government under David Cameron supported the invasion of Iraq and they too are culpable as a result of that. So both the major parties in Britain are, are blamed for this and it leads behind a serious legacy of distrust between the people of Britain and the established politicians. I mean, any a sort of attempt to try and um, talk about foreign policy in any sort of way shut down. You remember the the uh, the issue of uh, the, the 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 speech that Cameron made very recently abroad when it came to uh, Muslims silently condoning the uh, the the ISIS in the country. He made very explicitly said he said essentially that. Anybody who talks about foreign policy as a means of radicalization is, pack, is passing the book, passing the blame. So any sort of issues when it comes to foreign policy is constantly shut down. It's never ever seen to be any legitimate conversation with the government as being a real source of radicalization. And when you compare that with the agenda that and the links that defense companies and arms country, country, uh, companies have with the government, then it makes sense. It, it doesn't, it's not in the government's interest. It's not profitable for them to have foreign policy as a legitimate discourse when it comes to issues as such. The answers to our simple questions reveal a simple truth, the level of confusion and unease amongst the Western public towards their own government's military actions in Syria and Iraq and role in the rise of ISIL. Western powers have also killed far more innocent civilians in the last 15 years than that terrorist grouping. Indeed, American and British wars and aggressive foreign policies have destroyed Iraq and Syria. To many, it seems increasingly clear that the blame for the creation of ISIL itself and similar terrorist groupings lies at the doorstep of the West.